Amen. All right. Hey, we're in the third installment of Got Questions. Got Questions. And just as a, by way of recap, part one, um, we kind of uh, looked at the question Jesus asked, do you understand what I've done for you? And we talked about the heart of a servant and how God has called us to this foot washing posture that we don't need to be posturing ourselves or projecting something we're not. We don't need to, we don't need to think of a certain roles or servant uh, positions or to, to be beneath us, but we need to have a heart of a servant, and that's a blessable heart. So that is a blessable person who positions himself for the blessing of God. Um, last week in part two, we answered the question that Jesus stated, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Which is a very important question. And we said he, that he is Lord, he is King, he is God, and so we dissected a little bit of who he is as the Messiah. Today, this question this week has to do with someone who um, has gotten in the way of themselves. I don't know if you've ever gotten in the way of yourself before. If anyone here has ever gotten like, uh, if you've ever been your own worst enemy, then this message is for you. It's like, like well, this question will be for us. Jesus meets a man in the multitudes of a lot of different people, and he's sick, he's lame, he's crippled. Let's pick it up in John chapter 5. You should have some handouts or up here on the screen. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, and this pool was called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. And I want you to picture this. this there, was, there was a phenomenon that was happening around this pool of Bethesda that, that drew multitudes of sick and lame and people that needed help, that needed healing. And so something that we're going to be told here, a phenomenon would happen that that a healing moment, a healing breakthrough would happen. And so it would draw people from all over just so that they can get their, their miracle. And then he continues, For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, you thought Black Friday was trouble. <laughs> this was not like lame, crippled, diseased, infirmities, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease they had. And then they said, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. 38 years has been hanging around this poolside, this Bethesda, this when is my chance going to come? When's my miracle? When's my breakthrough? When's my big break or my opportunity, 38 years. And Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been in that condition a long time. And so Jesus says to him, and here's the question today, do you want to be made well? Do you, and this wasn't an insensitive thing. Like, obviously, he wants to be made. Well, Jesus wasn't being insensitive or patronizing him. Actually, that word well, some of your translations in, in the Bible may translate that word whole. In, in Greek, it's hygeus. And that's what it literally means, whole or complete or sound. And so what Jesus is doing here is, in this moment, He's trying to uncover and expose something so much deeper than this guy's physical infirmities. Because Jesus, look, hey, Jesus doesn't want to make you better. He wants to make you whole. Amen. How many you know you can receive a healing from God and still not be whole? Hey, your life can get better and not be whole. So Jesus asks a very important question for us here today that we're going to dissect. Do you really, do you want to be well? Do you want to be whole? And the sick man answered him, check this out. This is Jesus. Is, I believe he's asking it because he wants to expose something. Look at this sick man's answer. Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirring up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walk. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? This man gets asked this question, and he doesn't even really answer it, does he? He never answers the question. 
Do you want to be whole? Do you really want to be made well? Oh, thank you so much for asking. Finally, somebody asked me, here's what I need you to do. If you could just take care of that, and if you could take care of that, God, and, and fix this, and then and, and this over here, and those people over there, if you could just say, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, and, and I just think God is going, I, I'm not talking about them, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking to you. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be whole? You see, Jesus is so much more concerned when, when, than just our afflictions and our infirmities. In fact, God, God is not as concerned as the things that are happening around you and outside of you than what's happening on the inside of you. Amen. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. That's what I think Jesus even is exposing in this question about wellness our wholeness is just not our outside circumstances. It's what's happening on the inside of us. And if you want to be well, if you want to be whole, then, then you have to get the victory in the battlefield of your mind before the victory is manifested in your reality. How many of you guys know that? We have to get over what this man had, what I'm calling today stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. Uh, we all have it from time to time. We all get into this, this stinking thinking. But we, every one of us do. But check it out. If we're not careful, if we don't have some checkpoint, some health point, something to pull us out of stinking thinking, check it out. You can be stuck in the same spot for 38 years. Thinking the same things, making the same excuses, struggling with the same struggles, bound by the same strongholds. Come on, somebody. Are you ready today? Do you want to be? Do you want to be whole? Do you want to be made well? Here's what stinking thinking looks like. I want you to take some notes. We're going to look at not only this man's stinking thinking, but even some other people in the Bible yeah, we, can, we can relate to and uh, that had some, some faulty thinking processes. Here's the first one. Write it down, you guys. I stink. <laughs> some of us have this like, I stink. Look, you've, you've lost hope in yourself. And that's really what, what the situation of this crippled man was. 38 years in the same condition, he was hopeless. He lost hope in himself. And so when God asks you, do you want to be made whole? A lot of you, and what too many people think, they say, well, I've made too many mistakes. That's where our mind goes to. It goes to why we cannot. What's wrong with me? I'm, I can't. I've made too many mistakes. My, I've messed up my life too much. I'm disqualified. I'm unworthy. And a part of this whole being Holy guys, when we think I stink, we relate to this crippled man. I'm not, I'm not quick enough. I can't, I'm not strong enough to, to, to get there. Someone always beats me there. I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not Christian enough. I'm not spiritual enough. I am not enough. It's stinking thinking that'll keep you crippled and paralyzed and in that same spot year after year. I stink. Stink. I'm not good. And you may not say I stink. I know it's funny. I'm, all of them are going to say stink. But you may say one of those things. I'm not smart enough, pretty enough, good enough, Christian enough, spiritual enough. I have too much going. Look, Exodus chapter 3 verse 10, Moses was afflicted by some stinking thinking himself. He told God, when God said, you're the one who's going to be delivering my people, he said, who am I? Who am I? I mean, do you know who you're talking to, God? I stink. I'm disqualified. I'm, I, 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 I'm, I murdered someone. It was accidental. Yes, I was trying to defend someone. I thought it was a good cause, but I overstepped you, God, and I messed up big time, and I ran away from it, ran away from my calling for many years. Who do you, who am I? I stink, God. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of, who am I that you could do something great in? No, 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 that can't be me. Greatness can't come from me because I'm not great. I stink. I'm disqualified. Who am I? And you can just fill in that blank with whatever that you tell yourself and the things you tell yourself. Who am I? I just, I man, I just got divorced. I just, I can't keep my job. I can't, I can't keep ahead. I can't, I can't get over X, whatever it is. And this is, this is, this is the things we tell ourselves that stinking thinking. But spoiler alert here in Moses, okay, he does, yeah, once he gets past his stinking thinking, he does become the deliverer of Egypt. And God does use him in a great way. 
And if you've, if you've ever gotten to this place where you thought to yourself, I'm not enough, whether it's smart enough, cool enough, Christian enough, spiritual enough, whatever, I, what, this stinking thinking of I, who am I, I stink. If that has ever been a stronghold or a thought process that keeps coming up in your life, check it out. I can almost guarantee, almost guarantee that you have played the victim card often in your life, that you have a victim mentality. And I know that's hard. I mean, okay, so, so if I were to start off saying, oh, you, uh, you know, stinking thinking is a victim mentality, none, none of you can relate to that. But, but if you do say, I'm not enough, then, then you, you lean towards victimization, that I'm just, uh, I, victims make themselves innocent sufferers. They tell a story in such a way that, that avoids whatever they have done or neglected to do or, or, or how they've contributed to the problem that they're in right now. For instance, last week, your boss took you off of a big project, hurt your feelings. So you complained to everybody but your boss. You told him how terrible he, he was and how awful your boss is, but you left out the part of you left him high and dry and you kept being late on that project. Out your amen. Okay, I, so, so be careful because this stinking thinking will, will, will move you to a place where you play that victim mentality. Where you play, oh, who am I? I'm not good enough to get there, God, like this, like this man did. Maybe that's not you. Maybe you don't have that form of stinking thinking, the I stink. Maybe it's this one where you tell, you look at other people and you go, man, you stink. You stink. Come on, go to that next slide for me, please. Yeah, thank you. You stink. It's this stinking thinking where you look at others and, and now it's not that you've lost all hope in yourself. Some of you have lost all hope in people. Like people have failed you enough, they've hurt you enough, they've betrayed you enough, they let you down enough, they just, they just miss the expectation enough that you finally go, you know what, people stink. I just had enough of people. This man, this cripple, he said, no man to put me, I have no man to put me in to the pool. I don't know if you ever feel like you're on your own, like it's all up to you. It's, if you've ever been terribly let down, hurt by someone, broken by someone, listen to me, church, you can walk again. You can rise again. Jesus wants you to get up from that thinking, but our hope is lost in others. It sometimes causes us to not get up because our hope is lost in other people, to not even consider getting well. Elijah, he felt this way about people as well. In 1 Kings chapter 19, he says, Lord God Almighty, talking to God now, I have always served you, you alone. And this is another, another thing that, that will stink and think will cause you to do. It'll cause you to over-exaggerate your innocence, over-exaggerate how good you are and how I haven't contributed to any of the problem. I have always served you, God. And when Elijah is actually not serving him right now, he's actually not doing what God has called. He's hiding from God and not wanting to go be the prophet and not go, I've always served you and you alone. But I'll tell you what the problem is. People stink. It's those people, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. It's their fault. They tore down the altars. They killed all your prophets. It's the church's fault. The church is bad, and the church is evil, and the people are evil. It's that company's fault, and it's the company evil. And stuff. God, I'm the only one left. And they are trying to get me. They're trying to fire me, too, now. They're trying to get me out of here, too. You stink. This is, I'm telling you, this is stinking thinking. It's this victim mentality where people can get into very easily. And if you ever do this, if you get into this like stinking thinking, it'll do, it'll do a few different things. And these aren't in your notes, but a few different things it'll do. It keeps us from doing God's will. Stinking thinking, whether it's I stink or you stink, it'll keep you from doing God's will. It'll keep you from being productive. Like Elijah sitting underneath that juniper tree, paralyzed, like the crippled man, paralyzed. Some of us are paralyzed in the same spot we've been in, telling the same stories, blaming the same people. That's where the enemy wants us. Stuck. Keeps us from doing God's will, being productive. Here's another thing it keeps us from. It keeps us from seeing God's blessing, the provision of God, the faithfulness of God. Elijah himself, he was being fed by the ravens. Like day and night was probably getting provision of food, but it kept him, the st stinking thinking kept him from seeing the hand of God operating in his life. I stink, you stink, we all stink. <laughs> here's, here's, here's this last 
stinking thinking, and that's just where life stinks. Life, life's unfair. I just, I got dealt a bad hand. And some of you may feel like in this place today where you feel stuck. I'm stuck. Maybe you've given into a broken pattern. John chapter 5, verse 7, the sick man, he answered, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirring. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes ahead of me. And when you've seen a pattern like this, you guys, for 38 years, the hopelessness that this guy must, 38 years of close calls, 38 years of somebody else getting the miracle, 38 years of someone else getting the blessing or the promotion or the opportunity, 38 years, you might feel the need to give up. Give up on, on, on being someone in the pool that can actually get there. Give up on getting well. Give up on hope for better things. You know, the, the scary thing about hopelessness, hopelessness breeds in action. Hopelessness will cause us, it'll lead us to just stay stuck. Have you just been the same Christian for the last 10 years, two years, or same husband, same father, same for servant, same place. Do any of these sound familiar? I'll never get out of debt. I'm a bad parent. I can't get ahead. I'm not good with people. My marriage will never be saved. I'm tired of these thoughts that I'm having about women. I'm tired of always giving in to my temptation. I'm tired of hiding this issue. Romans chapter 8 verse 6 says this. So letting your sinful nature what? Control your mind. It leads to stinking thinking. It'll lead to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. The enemy is not, he's not in a boxing match with you, you guys. He's in a wrestling match for control of your mind. His goal is to immobilize you, lock you, pin you down, and keep you stuck right there in that same thinking pattern. This is where David was. Here's another person in the Bible. David had this same problem of stinking thinking in Psalm chapter 73. But as for me, my feet almost had slipped. I almost lost my footing, man, because I, uh, I nearly lost my foothold because I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the way. Other people were getting the blessing. Other people were getting the promotion. Other people were getting the miracle. And here I am. I believe God and I, I do good things and I go to church and I'm a believer. And I, why is this, is it not happening for me? And he says, when my heart, continue, when my heart was grieved and my spirit was bitter, that's what happened when you get, when you get stinking thinking in your mind. It weighs your heart down heavy. And your spirit, he says, is bitter. He says, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. And that, that's the inevitability of stinking thinking. You start just, you're, you're a frustrated, angry victim. I stink, you stink, life stinks. And a lot of people get to this place and they're hard to be around, aren't they? It's, it, this, this topic is, do you want to be well? So important because our lives will move in the direction of our strongest beliefs. Are you, are you hearing me, guys? Your life, whatever your, most, your strongest beliefs are, that's the way your life is going to move towards. But we don't have to stay stuck in stinking thinking. Do you want to be made well? The answer is yes. We have to change our mentality. We have to change the way we think, the way we process, the way we believe. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 12 says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is actually your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern. Don't, don't fall into the mindsets and the patterns and the customs of this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. That word renew, it means renovation. That's what it means, that your mind needs to be renovated. 
It needs to be torn down and built back up. That the, the way that one translation said we need to be transformed by the way we think. Here's what I want to do to combat our stinking thinking today that maybe some of us are in. Either one of those, all of those, in order to, in order to get back on a healthy track, in order to become well and whole. Here's what we need to do. Write it down. We have to establish true north thinking. True north thinking. Thinking. Now, what is true north thinking? It, it, is, it is establishing an act, a moral compass, a belief compass, a value compass that pulls me back. No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what I feel. It's not matter what I'm thinking. It doesn't matter what the, world is, what, what the world says. True north thinking is established on the word of God. The word of God is your true north that you need to always come back to. A minister acquaintance of mine was chatting with his neighbor he was telling me about and this he this neighbor was not an attender of of, of his church or anything and he was actually talking about his, his daughter and he said they're, they're giving their daughter exposure to many religions they don't force their daughter who's still in school we don't force our kid to go to church she only goes if she wants to and and the the minister kevin he replied well what if she doesn't want to go to school and and the neighbor said well that's different she has to get an education Okay, so, so he's, he's thinking, I get it, they're following their thinking, but check it out, their thinking is wrong. Their logic is wrong. We gotta constantly revisit true north, which is the word of God. A map that it will always have, it'll always have north on top. Imagine being on a flight from Los Angeles to New York, and the pilot says, hey, uh, gets on the intercom and says, hey, one of our passengers that uh, you know, is questioning our instrument panel, that, that no, we're not traveling in the right direction in north, so we're gonna go ahead and, 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 and take a little consensus here uh, because, because this, this passenger does, does not believe that we're going in the right direction. Would you guys feel a little afraid in that moment, right? You have to be a, a fool to not trust the compass. Only a fool questions the compass. True north is a fixed, inarguable landmark. The needle of the compass will always point to the magnetic north pole. And I think a lot of us, we're, we're so open-minded that we're entertaining every thought that shows up without a true north. And we're entertaining the thoughts, and we're not bringing it back to true north. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 tells us in this realm of stinking thinking where true north is, you guys. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true and whatever is noble. See, oh, what you're thinking or saying might be true, but is it noble? Amen. Whatever is right and whatever is pure, just because you're right doesn't mean you're right. <laughs> is, it, is it what you're saying is right, but is it pure? Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. True North principles are established by the word of God. And if you want to become whole, you need to know your true North. You need to establish a true North. Let me give you some true North principles today that are gonna help you be, uh, gonna help you overcome stinking thinking that we're talking about today. All right, write, write these down. Here's number one. Here's your first true north principle. And I put them in these statements because these are your thoughts now. This is, this is what we need to tell ourselves. I am not my wounds. I am not my past. I am not my sin. I am not my mistake. I am not my issue. I am not my habit. I am, I am not, I am defined by the word of God. I need to come back to my true north. Sometimes the barrier to my healing is my thinking. Proverbs 23 and 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. See, in order to establish true north thinking, you have to transform your thinking from your current situation to your true north reality. See, God doesn't define you by your situation. He does not define you even by who you are now. God defines you by your potential. 
God defines you by your completed product. He's already there. See, this is Romans chapter 4, verse 17, tells us how, how he did this with Abraham. As scripture says, I have made you the father of many nations. Abraham believed when he stood in the presence of God, who gives life to dead people, look at this, and calls into existence the things that aren't even there yet, the things that aren't even real yet. I want you to imagine Abraham, 100 years old, meeting the new people. Hey, how you doing? I'm Abraham, father of many nations. Nice to meet you. Oh, wow, really? Where, where's, where's your kids? I don't have any. Here, look, in order, to, in order to establish this true north thinking, in order to walk by faith, you have, to, you have to be willing to look like a fool for a while. Amen, somebody. You got you to you be willing to sound like a fool because you got to be able to speak those things that are not as though they were. You, gotta, you, you, you can't get stuck in your current crippled, lame, d- challenged, difficult, whatever your situation is. You, you, that is not who you are. You need to speak by faith who God has called you to be. Now, this, this irks me sometimes in alcohol recovery programs, and some of you, and I don't mean to like speak down on anyone who, who goes through alcohol recovery programs or 12-step rep- recovery programs like this, but I've been to some and sat in on, on some with people, and, and they'll say something like this when they introduce themselves. Hey, I'm so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic, and, and I've been clean now for 21 years. Hey, I'm a, hi guys, I'm, I'm so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic, and I've been sober now for four years, okay? And, and I just, I get what they're trying to do there. I understand the philosophy there that you have to own your mistakes and own your, your past and own even your pro- proclivities and your, and your habits. I get that, and I understand what they're doing. But listen to me, True North says that is not who you are. That you are not your past. You are not defined by that mistake. You are not defined by that. That God defines you by something so much better and bigger and greater. And until you start calling yourself and thinking yourself that way, you will not walk that way. Because I want to tell you something, you guys. My name is Jason Hannish, and I am not my sins. I am not an addict. I am not. I am a child of the living God. I am a servant of God. Amen, somebody. This is what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 says, that those old things are gone. Behold, I'm doing a new thing in your life. You need to be able to stand up and speak, the, speak a true north reality. I am not those old things. I am, if you want to get rid of the stinking thinking, this is the first step right here. You, got, you, you, have, to, you have to know who you are in Christ, that those old things, that's not how God sees you. That is not who you are. Here's the second thing that we need to understand as well. That you, you are not the problem. Not you. I'm talking about this is you saying it. This is you speaking this. I am not my wounds. You are not my problem. You're not my problem. See, when we create a victim narrative, it often is followed by a villain story. Let me help you see this, okay? Because, because, because of my situation and because I'm, I'm a victim now to the circumstance and the situation, not only do I paint a narrative and a story of, ah, I stink, and now what happens is because I'm a victim, there's also a villain. And, and hear me, some of you have made people into villains in your minds. In your narrative, they're a villain, and it justifies the way that you talk about them and treat them now. Yeah. And look, what you need to get to a place that not only who I am by faith, that I am not my wounds, but you need, to, you need to believe this as well. True North says that you are not my problem. People are not my problem. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse three and four. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of what? Human reasoning and destroy 
false arguments. This is what, this is what you do. This thinking, thinking. Some of you believe that people are your problem. You've convinced yourself in your narrative, in the people that you're trying to get on your side of a narrative, that that person is the problem. Therefore, if you're a Christian, what you probably do is you view them as the stronghold. You view them as the argument you're trying to tear down, and you're trying to tear down people, and God has not called you to tear down people. He's called you to tear down arguments, human reasoning that would set itself up against the word of God. And if you're not careful, our victim stinking mentality about ourselves and life will cause us to paint a picture on people and paint them as villains and try to treat them as a stronghold, and they're not the problem. Man, somebody, I'm preaching today. I know I'm upset. Look, I'm, I'm upset. <laughs> I'm so excited. Ephesians chapter 6 says, Our fight is not against people. People aren't your problem. Your boss isn't your problem. Your boss isn't your problem. Stop showing up late, dang it. Do your job. Go to school. I don't know. You, look, it's not your problem. It isn't. Even if, even if they, I'm not saying they're not evil people and bad people trying to do bad things, but I'm, what I'm saying is they are not your problem. And as long as you think they're your problem, you'll have stinking thinking. You'll, you'll, you'll have some stinking thinking, man. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, the Bible says. We're fighting against spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly realms. So what is, what's true north? True north. Get back to true north here because... I'm not my wounds, I'm not my past, I'm not my sin, I'm not my issues, man. And you know what? You're not my problem. That's not it. Here's, here's another one. Here's another true north principle to get you away from stinking thinking, and that is this, that my life has purpose in every season. My life has purpose in every season. And I think that sometimes we can feel so stuck or feel like, like and then we start speaking against the season that we're in, we have contempt for the season and the situation and the circumstances, and we're no longer able to see the blessings of God. We're no longer able to walk in God's will. We're no longer able to be productive in our life because we've missed the purpose of the season. We've missed the purpose of maybe the pain that we're in. I was meeting with a, a pastor, a friend of mine just this week, just a couple days ago. And he was talking to me about the, the season that he is in. And, and his wife got uh, diagnosed with cancer. And they had to go through a time of chemo. And, and just ending that, had her, she had her final treatment of chemo, 16 weeks. Still going to get results and, and believing in faith of, what, uh, of the healing that, that is going to happen. But I'm sitting down and having breakfast with him and encouraging him. And we're just follow, fellowshipping. Uh, and, and he blessed me. I was there to bless him, but this guy blessed me so much. He said, Pastor, when I, when I, when I come back in, because right now he's, he's taking a little break to, to uh, be with his family, be with his kids, minister to them. And he said, when I come back in, I want to I do something with married couples. Because what God has shown me in this season is a love that I never thought I would ever experience. That, that a, a sacrificial love that has taken me to a place in my own life and in my own marriage and our own intimacy that I've never seen modeled for me, neither has my wife, but in this situation, because we looked to God, that I have a, a, a love that I have never experienced in my life for my wife, and I want to teach some married couples how to, how to love each other, how to sacrificially lay your life down for your spouse. And I was just so blessed that this, this guy who's going through turmoil and struggle and, and radiation and his wife is and seeing his wife lose hair and lose energy could see the hand of God in the midst. You know why? Because there is purpose in every season. Amen. There is purpose in every season. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has made everything beautiful for its own time. Not everything is beautiful. Cancer is not beautiful. That's not beautiful, man. That's, that sucks. That's, that stinks. You know what I'm saying? That sucks. Cancer is not good. But with God, he has this amazing ability to turn those things that the enemy meant for evil around for our good in its own time. I have purpose in every season. What if you've been waiting for something in your circumstances to change, but God has been trying to change something inside of you? 
And some of you maybe gave in to stinking thinking, and you're saying something like this. It is what it is. Oh, life's just something. It is. it is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. But with God, it's not always what it seems. Amen. Where you see failure, God sees future. Where you see rejection, God sees refinement. See, what if the thing that produced your pain is the very thing that God wants to use to release his power in your life? Oh, there is purpose. There is purpose. My life has purpose in every season. That's, that's true north. Here, let me give you this last one. We need, to, we need to hurry up here. This last one. I must believe and then walk out my wholeness. Now, I... God is a miracle work in God, and he can instantaneously do an amazing, phenomenal work in our life, a work of healing. He did it for this man. But in this, in this when we're talking about wholeness, do you want to be well? Do, do you want to be whole? That's not a magic wand that is, that is waved. That's not a snap of the fingers. That's not an instantaneous miracle. Please hear me, that your wholeness must be walked out for the rest of your life. You will be conformed to this image of God that you must believe. Think about this guy, this guy who, 38 years now, and Jesus could have, he didn't reach down and help him up, say, come on now, come on, get up. He said, get up, rise, take up your bed, get up on your own two feet, start walking. This guy for 38 years, he had to have a moment where he, his thinking changed. He, his, his hope changed, his belief changed. That not, he wasn't waiting for like, the water now, he heard the word of God. It wasn't, I don't need a, a miracle. I don't need a towel. I don't need, I don't need to go to a revival experience. I just need a word of God. And I, I received that word. And something in his thinking changed for him to get up of his own volition, on his own accord to rise. That he had to believe. But then he had to pick up his own mat and walk. And walk out his, his healing. And walk out his wholeness. Philippians chapter 2 talks about this when it says this. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Now, it doesn't say work hard to be saved. You can't, be, you can't work for salvation. That's why it's separated in scriptures. S look, you are saved by faith through grace. You can't earn it or deserve it. It is a free gift of God in the moment. You don't have to fill out a connection card for it. You don't have to get baptized for it. You don't have to raise your hand for it. You don't got to do anything. The moment that you believe, the Bible says you are saved. That's it. It's free. You don't have to do anything for it. But then there's this, there's this other part of salvation that we got to walk out because that's not the finish line. That's the starting line. It's a lot of things fall off of us and you are made new in, in your thinking and, in your, and even in some areas of your heart and your desires. But, but there is, for every one of us, there is a walking out with God where, where Paul says, hey, you got to work hard to walk this thing out now to pursue, produce the results of your salvation because check this out. God is the one who's actually going to be working in you. When you, when you hear that word, and some of you need, you can rise again, and I, I'm just believing and been praying for you all week, that although you have every reason to not hope, that today you'd one more time hope again. And that, and that in, in that moment that you hope again, that you believe again, that, that you, God, it will be working in you to rise. Not only to do that, but he'll give you the desires, go back please, he'll give you the desire and the power change. He'll, he'll, it won't even be you working now. That, that as you walk this thing out, God will be, the Holy Spirit will be moving in you, changing your heart, changing your desires, changing your thinking, giving you power to do what pleases Him. Do you want to be well? Here's that question. Do you want, do you want to be whole? Do you want, it's, it's so much more than your outside circumstances, your, in, your infirmities and your afflictions and your situations and the people around you and the things around you. No, 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 no. Do you want to be whole? Do you want to change? I believe in God can do that today. All you need is one ounce of belief and you can rise again. Come on, let's bow our heads all across this worship center. I want to pray for you.